So uh, I guess the first question you're probably asking today is, uh, who is this ponytail guy standing up in front of you? Uh, my name is Greg Shields. I am a senior partner with an independent analyst firm called Concentrated Technology. That's concentratedtech.com. Uh, I've been working in the industry for over 15 years, doing various IT jobs, all the way from help desk to consultant through engineer. Lately, I've been doing a lot of writing for all the different magazines out there and uh, traveling and standing up in front of people like yourself and helping you figure out some of these problems with some of these things that shouldn't really have these kinds of problems. Um, uh, thank you. And, and occasionally working for, for various training people like CBT Nuggets. Thank you. So this session is it's kind of interesting because I got an opportunity to travel a lot. And in getting that opportunity to travel a lot, I get a chance to speak with a lot of people just like yourself. And it's funny. The more times that you spend in front of, an audience, er, in front of clients, and the more time that you talk with them about certain things, you start to discover that there are these similarities in the problems in which they see in their environments. Right? And it's interesting also because if you're an outside person, you start walking into that environment, you know what's going on, right? You, you sit every day in front of the same screens and you're looking at the same checkboxes all the time. And after a while, if you look at the same set of checkboxes, right, doesn't it start to seem like it should be correct? Walking in from the outside is kind of interesting because you just get that opportunity to go, oh yeah, by the way, if you check this box, um, that'll fix everything and here's the invoice. So. <laughs> We have, uh, we have very inexpensive consulting rates, by the way. ConcentratedTech.com. Anyway, the reality of HA and DRS is that really, they, they kind of, we want them to do more than I think what they really do. The reality is that HA and DRS are there to solve two primary problems. Okay, you know what these are. Um, HA, what's HA there for? It's, it's protecting you against the loss of a host. Now, these sorts of events uh, tend to be kind of rare. Right? You, how often does the motherboard just blow on the, on the host that you have? Um, so HA is there to protect you in those cases where you have an entire host failure. Uh, it moves VMs off from one host onto others. It's very simple you know, in, in concept. HA works in combination with this other thing called DRS. Don't worry, if this is really, really basic for you, I'm getting to the interesting stuff here in a minute. So DRS's job is to load balance these virtual machines around. The idea of a cluster is such that we create a series of machines whose job it is is to effectively just provide places for these VMs to go. Now, how many people here have experience in clustering prior to VMware and ESX? Quite a few, that's good. So clustering has some tactics and some strategies that you have to use in order to be successful with those. What's interesting is that when you look at the different tactics and strategies and at the different failures that I think people make in these, they are relatively kind of the same whenever it depends on where you're you know, coming from. Now you remember a day not that long ago when VMware announced this incredibly sexy new technology called vMotion. Remember that? Right? How exciting was vMotion? Remember the first time you ever saw vMotion? You, they showed probably some video of some computer not doing anything different as it moved around across different hosts. And that was just patently impressive at the time, right? Well, it's not been that many years ago that that was incredibly impressive. I mean, nowadays, let me, sh let me show you a demo of vMotion. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. So really, what do you do? You hit migrate, you choose a, a, a new host, and poof, it does its thing. So in a very not, not very long period of time, vMotion has gone from one of those things that was just fundamentally, patently amazing to just something that you do. What's useful, however, is in recognizing that vMotion itself is just the facilitator for what is really 
a very complex set of modeling and, and, and monitoring and mathematics were really all the, the titillating pieces of what this thing is where they lie today. So, at least to me, what's useful is recognizing where you have made mistakes with HA, with DRS, that are impacting vMotion's ability to do its job. I told you, right? A surprising number of environments have configured their settings incorrectly. How many people here would consider themselves a small environment? Right? Kind of small environment. 25%, right? A little bit more. How about how many people are of large environment? Right? So we're about the same. The rest of you don't are either in the middle or don't really know why you're here. Um, it's interesting because in the small environments, a lot of these mistakes are made because you just don't have a lot of hardware, right? Where am I going to fail over my virtual machines when I got three hosts? Well, I got option A, B, and C. If I got 500 hosts, well, this is a much easier thing. So a lot of environments, well, they, they, they make mistakes because of just simple hardware constraints. They just don't have a lot of money. Uh, other environments just did not design their architecture with HA or DRS in mind. Again, hardware constraints impact this. Now, for those of you that are the larger environments, how many people, when you started with VMware, you bought 500 servers at a, at a pop, right? The very first time. Right. OK, one guy. <laughs> I want to have your budget someday. Yeah, most of us don't, right? So even those of us that had the large environments, we started with, I don't know, one or three or five, a small number. And as we scaled upwards, we just started, kept adding in more hosts and adding in more hosts. And then all of a sudden, we started to hit the problem where stuff wasn't really working in the way they, it seems like it used to be working. So in all of these travels, I've collected these 16 sort of big mistakes that you'll want to avoid as you build or scale your HA or DRS cluster. Are you ready? All right, let's do it. So big mistake number one. Not planning for hardware change. I've got these in a certain order, too. So if, this is, if you've already figured this out, put your head down. And we'll get to the interesting stuff in a minute. So the motion as a technology, right? This thing that moves VMs around requires there to be some similarity with the processors you have. Right? Unless you want to pretty significantly hack up the, 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 the processor features that are available, you can't be motion from Intel to AMD, or vice versa. What I think a lot of us sort of know in the back of our minds, but we may not consciously remember it, and when it is important, is the fact that processors must also be approximate families. So this is a, a getting dated graphic here for AMD that shows the AMD types of processors on, one, on the, the column, and then which ones that they have the ability to be motion against on the row. And some work, and some do not. This is the equivalent graphic there for Intel processors. Again, this graphic's getting a little old at this point. And most of us recognize, again, that we have, that we can't do this. But the problem is that how often do you buy servers, right? Are you buying servers in generations? every couple, two or three years or so. And every time you buy new servers, there are new types of processors or new types of, of, of architectures that may or may not necessarily be motion with the other type of architectures you have. And so what you create are inadvertently these islands of vMotion capability. Right? I can vMotion in and amongst the, the, the Westmere group, but the 486s themselves do not, they can only be motion amongst themselves. I can't go back and forth. Now, one of the things you have to be conscious of is as that virtual environment ages, your hardware gets refreshed, new hardware gets added, and so while you're creating those islands of compatibility, you need to be conscious of how you create them and how the generationality of new hardware is going to impact that. So here's a question. How can we always vMotion between computers? How can we always vMotion between computers? Right? OK, uh, that's one. Uh, we can always refresh all of our hardware at the same time. That guy over there is probably doing it, right? The 500 <laughs> server guy back there. 
props. Uh, we can always cold migrate everything, right? We can do that. It's, it's like the vMotion, except with a very short downtime, right? We're familiar with that. Uh, or, as uh, someone up here at the front said, we have this technology called vMotion Enhanced Compatibility Mode. My guess is that many of you have not turned this mode on because it's, it's confusing. Right? A lot of these technologies, they're, they're not turned on because they're just not, they're not named very well. And so what EVC does is it sort of enforces the islandification of all the hardware that you have. This is a picture of it. And when you create that cluster, you turn on vMotion EVC for whatever hosts you have, and it simply goes about making sure that you cannot add another host into that cluster that does not support the minimum requirements of that cluster. Who's using this stuff, right? Not a lot of you. Those of you that aren't, you can light this thing up tonight. Be aware if you turn it on, there's gonna be some really weird having to move machines around and to, to get them into said cluster. But turning on this vMotion EVC protects you against the situation where you have all of these hosts in a cluster, and the cluster is making its calculations based off of the fact that they all can be motion against each other, but they can't. Huh? So big mistake number one, plan for hardware change and plan to turn on this VMware EVC because all it does, at the very least, is it creates the island, it enforces the islands for you so that you don't end up realizing too far down the line that you can't vMotion from one type of host to another type of host. Is this a big wow? Eh, been around for a while. Don't worry, I got 16 of these things. Number two, not planning for SV motion is another big tactic. And this I find uh, most problematic with the smallest of, envir <coughs> of environments. <coughs> Who here has virtual machines with snapshots attached to them? Still today. Stop. <laughs> is someone applauding in the back too? <laughs> Okay, who here has actually had a career-limiting move or a resume-producing event because of snapshots? All right, yep. Sorry about that. All right, what were snapshots supposed to be? They were supposed to be in, I'm just gonna do something stupid, so let me snapshot at first protectionary maneuver, right? And snapshots were intended for a very short period of time, as in just about as long as the stupid thing you're doing. Uh, keeping them around has a whole host of fallout effects that you just don't want to deal with. So if you're doing snapshots today, get rid of them. Um, they're, they're just, and, and when you roll them back in, don't call me, or do call me, actually. Um, first, snapshots don't work with SV motion. Also, virtual machine disks have to be in persistent mode or as RDMs. The real big kicker here is the fact that the host must have sufficient resources to support two instances of that VM running for a brief time. Now, how brief is that time? Is however long it takes for you to copy the enormity of its VMDK file over. So if you have a small environment, uh, that can be a problem if you're getting up against the, you know, the, the, the maximum amount of resources that you have. Uh, and, and the host must be, have access to source and target, things like that. One of the things you're going to notice in and amongst a lot of these is unfortunately the, 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 the sheer fact that, well, the answer for a lot of the HADRS problems is buy hardware. <laughs> That's the hidden secret here is that the answer for everything is just buy more stuff. That's big mistake number three. Not simply having enough cluster hosts. Now, I like to remind everybody here that uh, you cannot change the laws of physics. Right? You cannot simply put three hosts together and assume that you can v, or P to V 8 million virtual machines onto those hosts. The laws of physics still apply no matter what VMware may tell you in terms of new feature sets. So for HA to fail over a VM, there have to be enough resources available elsewhere in the cluster. And here's an important point that a lot of people want to forget. The fact that those resources must be set aside or reserved or wasted, right? I have to have a set of resources here that are not in use so that when I have a failure, I have a place for those virtual machines to go. 
Many environments don't plan for cluster reserve when design designing their clusters. Right? They go and they think, ah, oh, we, we got enough VMs for, I, I did this myself in the earliest days, right? Oh, you have uh, 30 VMs and I can fit two, 10 VMs for host, I'll buy three hosts. Well, what I do is I don't actually create enough locations for places for, uh, places for those VMs to go, right? A fully prepared cluster must set aside one full server's worth of resources in preparation for that HA event. So I've got four hosts. I've got to reserve one of those hosts in preparation for the excrement hitting the air movement device. All right? Are you there? Do you ha have you set this aside? Have you built this into your cluster? Hopefully there's, there's not this aha moment right now for a few of you. This, oh gosh. So along these lines, how is this done? This is done through uh, a two-step two process. The first step process is turning on your admission control policy uh, by enabling admission control. There's the admission control policy there. You just set this to enable and it turns it on. The second step then is to set host failures cluster tolerance to one. Now, in my mind, this, this is the best part about being a complete independent and not being a partner or customer of VMware is that I can say whatever I want. Um, let me ask you this. Is that not the worst named feature or selection in any product you've ever seen? Can anybody tell me what host failure cluster tolerates actually means? I, I think that they should have called this, how many servers do you want to waste? <laughs> the marketing people probably didn't like that. Um, so you said host failure stuff cluster tolerates to one. Now, what does this mean? This means that the cluster is going to set aside one host's, the equal amount of one host's amount of resources distributed amongst all of the, the hosts that are there so that if a host fails, there's places for those VMs to go. Okay, does this make complete and perfect sense? Yes. Now, setting this aside, you can see, if you have a very large environment, let's say you have 32 hosts, and there's a concern that you might have multiple hosts that fail at the same time, and you still want to provide protection, then you would set that to two, or six, or whatever your level of oh my godness is. Most of us are gonna set this to one because we're preparing for a single failure uh, across that cluster. So step one is turn on admission control policy. Step two is set host failures cluster tolerance to one. That's big mistake number three. Big mistake number four is setting host failures cluster tolerates to one. <laughs> if you set host failures cluster tolerates to one, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm wasting a whole host. Do you know how much I spent on that piece of hardware? That's a lot of hardware. I mean, how, how who here's got the hundred, well he does, has the hundred thousand dollar budget to go buy, you know, another host. I mean, how much effort do we have to go through as IT pro, I mean, you know the effort, right? Uh, boss, I need to go buy three hosts that actually do work, and then I need to buy one. Let's just say it's not really working at all. Right? How are you going to justify that? Right? That's, you just uh, tell them. Don't tell them. Exactly. Smoke, mirrors, mirrors, smoke. It's the IT stuff that you don't care about. So for those of us that don't believe in the just lie to them um, <laughs> approach to <laughs> IT, <laughs> there is a, there's another setting, OK? And this is all predicated around the idea that not all of your VMs are priority one. Now, I'm sure some of you have a situation where every VM is priority one, right? I, 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 I was once, I used to work for a weather, the, the, the next generation satellite weather prediction system, right? Uh, I, I was, that was a, the project was InPost project. And uh, this project had a 99.5% uptime rating, was what we had to prove to the government. And I was reading through the paper one day, and it was a ski resort that had 100%. So some people think they need 100%. Weather satellites, they're cool with 99.5. Um, not all of your VMs are priority one. 
right? Uh, maybe it's the, the, the WSS server, or maybe it's the, uh, I don't know, the IT patch or the IT server, file server, whatever. Maybe it's the exchange server for the marketing people. I don't know. The, the, there's some host that you just don't care about if they actually you know, fail over or not. So setting aside a full host is wasteful if you know you've got a number of hosts that you just don't care about. So sec big mistake number four is in setting host failure cluster whatever to one. Instead, set the percentage of cluster resources reserved as failover spare capacity which is not the worst named one, but just the longest named one down here. This you will want to set to a lower value than one server's contribution to the cluster. Okay, here's some math. I'm, I'm gonna apologize for this, pull out your phones. So take out the number of hosts you have in your cluster and then figure out what one host's contribution is. So if I have four hosts, what's one host's contribution? Okay, if I have, I don't know, seven hosts, what's one host's con I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, you didn't know this was gonna be comedy hour. <laughs> so set this to a lower value than what that percentage is. Now what does this do? If I set this to a lower value than what that, what that does, is it ensures that it's, it's not gonna fail over all the VMs, right? So some of those VMs I don't have to really care about. I can say, you know what, I just don't really care if this VM fails, fails over or not, it's gonna be fine. Now that takes me to big mistake number five. If you do this, then it's a really good idea to prioritize which VMs get failed over. So there is a VM restart policy, which most of you probably ignored whenever you created a cluster. Uh, it is, uh, by default, I think it's set to medium. Uh, I tend to set mine to low as the default setting. That gives me two levels of um, this is really important, and then this is really, really important. And then individually, per each VM, then I set those settings for each VM. These become important during an HA event because if I've, I've constrained my clusters that I'm using less, well, then I now can then tear out which machines I care about and which machines I don't necessarily t uh, care about. And, and again, this allows me to just protect the hosts that I'm most interested in. Now, at this point, uh, VMware actually wanted me to say that it is the official policy of VMware that you protect all of your hosts, or all of your VMs, right? But, you know, then there's reality comes in the way. So, number six is actually disabling admission control. So, every so often, you get that, that junior IT pro, right? Or the, you know, the, the enterprising young admin who thinks that they're smarter than admission control. And I, you, you know you've done this. Right? You turn on HA and then you turn off admission control because the error messages go away. Right? <laughs> Aha. So, <laughs> this, I get all the benefits of HA without the waste. Also a bad idea. Right? Because what you're doing is, is when an HA event occurs, you don't have any controls in place to ensure that the HA doesn't try to put all the VMs on one host. Right? And then what happens when you've got a host that can really run four VMs that's actually running 14? It's, the disks get a lot of attention. So not a good idea. Never disable admission control. So it, it's surprising. You see this happen because, again, it's one of those error messages that people just want to get rid of, and so consequently, well, they, they get rid of that. Now, a much more interesting story is this whole notion of the, the percentage policy. So back to that whole, you know, take the number of hosts and divide it by whatever and get a percentage. Whether you are a small environment or you are a large environment, there's a danger here if you don't update that percentage policy. Now think about that. Why does host failure cluster tolerates exist? It's automatic, right? At every point, no matter how many hosts I add or subtract into the cluster, I'm always gonna have one equal amount of hosts resources that are set aside for HA. Now, if I set the percentage policy, and I take four and I make 25%, and then I add four more hosts, what's the new percent? There was like a two second pause as everyone did math. 12 and a half percent, right? So 12 and a half percent is how much we would have with eight hosts, or somewhere you know, south of that. If I then go to 16 hosts or 10 hosts, I keep having to go back and adjusting this percentage policy, and it's something that gets forgotten because you don't get notified about it. So if you are not updating your percentage policy as you're adding and removing hosts, you're gonna find out that you may end up with different results than what you plan for. Okay, I'm a lazy IT pro, I'll just lie to them and set it back to host failures cluster tolerates, right? Yet here danger lies. 
Let me ask you a question, right? You've been doing this for a while, right? We've all been doing IT for at least a period of time. What's the, what's, what's the funnest part of IT? At least for me, right? Isn't it really buying equipment with somebody else's money? <laughs> I mean, really? Like, when, the, when they give you, like, a, like 50 grand or 100 grand to go buy stuff, and you're like, it's like micro center shopping spree. <laughs> I still get a kick out of it, you know? And, well, it's, I own the company now, which is not nearly as fun. But um, <laughs> when you go and you buy that stuff, right, you, 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 you're, you're specking out the new hardware, and you're trying to figure out what piece you want, right? And let's say you got, I don't know, four hosts or six hosts or whatever, right? Do you sometimes just get a little titillated at the whole idea of, I could buy a really beefy server with this, or I could buy a bunch of little servers? Do you? Sometimes? What do you do in that case? You buy them all. <laughs> Is that the same guy that's got 500 hosts there? You know, you might want to consider buying that beefy host, right? Because the beefy host is very fast, it's very powerful, it's got a lot of uh, bells and whistles. There's danger in buying these very powerful hosts, or more specifically, buying dissimilar hosts in a cluster. All right? Let's say I got four hosts again. For some reason, all clusters in my imaginary world have four hosts. Let's say I have four hosts again, and then I get a little bit of money, and I go, ooh, what should I do with this? I'm going to go buy the DL980X SuperDrive, whatever, right? And so I take my four hosts, and I add in a fifth host that's a super-duper powerhouse. What have I done? I have bought an immense server that is there for nothing more than waste, right? Think about that. Host failure cluster tolerate sets aside an amount of resources that are needed to protect every host. That means that any, any fully loaded server is going to be HA protected, including your biggest server. Has to be the case, right? Because HA has to protect against the loss of the big guy. So if you're choosing host failures cluster tolerates, it has to set aside the resources equal to the biggest server in the cluster. Review VMware. Don't just buy similar stuff, you know? and then save the big servers for your home data center. <laughs> you know you have one. <laughs> you know you have one. My wife actually goes to container store and buys racks for mine now, which is, okay, it's cool, right? Come on, we're IT guys. So number nine is uh, the host isolation response situation. I, in, to me, I think this is yet another one of those horribly named features. All right, when you first set this up, did you just ignore this because you had no idea what it meant? Did you? Now, let me ask you, how many people here have had an isolation incident? More than you care to admit. When that happens, how is that as a day? <laughs> Sucks, right? Yeah, and why is that? Why, 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 it, why does that day stink? It's, a, it's an isolation event, right? So, so what's an isolation event, right? I have my, my four host cluster, and uh, one of the hosts has lost communication over its management network, but the VMs are still running, right? So the VMs are out there, uh, we don't know what they're doing, but the host is isolated from the cluster. So this is a really bad day because, well, we have to figure out what to do. Now when I build that cluster, Right, I, I, I have two options here for um, the, uh, I'm sorry, the stop, bottom option here for host isolation response, which defaults to shut down. Now, as a good IT pro, when something defaults to shut down, we freak out, which we should, right? Wow, when something goes wrong, we're, we're gonna automatically shut down our VMs? That's a great day. Um, there are two other options, too, for power off and leave powered on. Now, what do most of you have it set to? We powered on, right? Except for the one guy that yelled shut down because he read my slide. The problem is, is that when a VM remains powered on, 
but can't be managed by those surviving cluster hosts, it's like this weird split brain and reverse problem, right? So it's out there, the, the cluster is like, I can't do anything. The, the, the VMs are still running, so the VMDK files are still locked by the file system, so we can't evacuate those, so you're kind of stuck in an I don't know what to do scenario. Um, you better get that. Um, one of the suggestions, this is VMware's suggestion, which I know goes counter to what a lot of you have done, but VMware's official suggestion is to use shutdown to gracefully shut down the VMs whenever this occurs. So I end up with some sort of management network you know, severance or hiccup or whatever management networks do when they go out to lunch, and shutting down those VMs is gonna release the lock so that HA can return those VMs back to the surviving cluster members and bring them back under management again. I, I don't know. I've, they made me put that up there. Um, it's hard for me to say this because I'm just like you in the fact that I don't want auto, anything automating the shutdown of my servers. This is the suggested guidance for how to return yourself to, to you know, steady state after an isolation event occurs. So I added the bottom line down here that, you know, set the policy to shut down, but then adjust your per VM settings for those important VMs that really, really shouldn't go down. So that at least you at least have some control over when you have an isolation event. Right? These isolation events, they suck, right? You, a lot of you put your hands in the air because they've, they're, they're just a nightmare to recover from, aren't they? Right? Don't you wish there were some new technologies that would improve the isolation situation? Yes, Greg. Show me. In VMware version 5, let me ask one question. How many people here are fully on VMware version 5? That's a, that was a joke, right? <laughs> so in VMware version 5, um, VMware now supports, they've completely rewritten, rewritten HA in 5. Uh, really, really smartly. Uh, the version 5 now has the ability to use the storage subsystem as a s option, a, a last line of defense, as it were, for when things go south. So we create this notion of a data store that exists as kind of a secondary heartbeat for HA. So I got my management connections up at one point, and all of those hosts are connecting into a data store where they can have sort of a backup channel in case the management network is lost. So what does this do? In that case where I have that management network loss, I now have another way for those hosts to communicate. I don't have to go through the isolation, you know, the post-isolation processes. I can still maintain the cluster but you can get the nice yellow dialog box that reminds you that, oops, something is going wrong today, okay? Um, now, there's an important caveat here in that for these heartbeat data stores to work, there is kind of an, in, like an internal assumption that the cluster hosts are gonna share one data store in common. Anybody here not from the United States, right? Anybody here not from the United States? A uh, reasonable number. That's a long flight, guys. A very long flight. Thank you for coming to see me. I appreciate you guys flying all the way here just to see me. Uh, according to VMware, those of us in the United States have less of a problem with this data store situation than do people um, in the European areas. And, and, and this is just something I was recently told. In the United States, just for some reason, the typical architecture for a cluster has all of the hosts at least sharing one data store, if not all the data stores, right? Is that how yours is configured today? Right, you're, you're sharing data stores across all the cluster members. And, and I, I was told, and again, this is just what I was told, is that in, in the European countries, this is not always necessarily the case. And it's just, a, it's just historical, it's just cultural in the way that, they're, that the, um, the, the clusters get configured. And so whether you're European or United States, if you are one of those environments where not every host connects to a single data store, I will suggest that if you want to use this when you move to 5.0, you create a data store whose job is nothing more than to contain the little files, the little heartbeat files that keep all of these things connected together. Okay, it doesn't have to be that big. These files aren't that large. I mean, how, how long does it take to spell the word still working? Um, 
megabytes, not gigabytes or terabytes. So having at least one data store in common, very, very important for uh, configuring these heartbeat data stores. Um, any questions about that? Any thoughts? One. So he said he didn't want to do that. <laughs> I would suggest not upgrading to five or not using this. So if, if, yes, you're right in that by creating more data stores, you create more, more, more traffic, um, but you, you, something's got to give. Right? So you're right, but this is an option that's available. This is the recommendation. Now, VMware does not say that you have to do this, but it is works best, read into that, works best when they're all connected to at least one uh, data store in common. Sure. Excellent question. Uh, can I use an existing data store or do I have to create a new one? No, you can use an existing data store. If you see up here, uh, I have just the data stores that are available that can be used for heart beating, right? The, they're there. So you can one if you want, all right? And you'll, when you play around with five, you'll see what all the configuration controls are for that. So big mistake number 10 is all of these resource restrictions that you can apply on VMs. I told you, I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people. And you, you remember back in the Active Directory days, the early days, right, when, 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 when you were just getting your MCSC, right, you remember this? You were probably that person. And you used to screw around with sites and services. Remember that? Remember that? And, and you were like, check it out, I can, I can create sites and services. Those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, put your heads down. Um, I can create sites and services, right? Well, now these days, what do you know? You, you don't screw with them, because it works, right? It, it, a lot of us tend to play around with these reservations, limits, and affinities, initially because we're getting our, our VCP and we need to check the box to verify that we know what we're doing. Um, Others are really doing it for an important reason. However, what's interesting is HA does not necessarily con consider these soft affinities at failover, right? When the, when the device fails, HA goes, ah, and then tries to get everything moved onto something else, and then figure out what to do next. And when that happens, the reservations and limits can constrain those resulting calculations. It makes it harder for HA to do its job, and this is particularly the case in small clusters, right? If you need to do resource constraining, they're there. You're still okay, it's okay to use them. But just use them, just limit their use wherever possible. And if you have to, if you really feel you the need to, use shares over reservations and limits because the shares balance those resource demands as opposed to setting hard thresholds. Right? It just makes it easier for the mathematical model that is DRS. The same is true with affinities. All right, does anybody use affinities here? Or can you think of the one anti-affinity that's still really important to use today? Direct, uh, domain controllers, right? So that's one very obvious you want. There, there are others, but limiting the use of affinities will just simplify the calculations and protect yourself against some sort of failover creating cascading effects. Does anybody use limits these days? Has anybody using like limits pretty, pretty heavily? One guy, one guy in the front, got a, not, not that many people, right? Don't ever use memory limits, ever. <laughs> ever. And they, they let me say this, Sue, too. I, so I, I, I think this is really important. I don't even know why this is in the product. I, okay, okay, I can, okay, okay, I can think of reasons. I can think of reasons. I can think of reasons. Let's see what happens with memory limits. Okay, there are situations, but let's see what happens, right? So I go and I create a VM and I assign it four gigs of RAM. And then after I assign it four gigs of RAM, then I set a one gig memory limit on that VM. What am I doing? When the VM lights up, it has no idea that there's a memory limit on it. So it's, it's a SQL server, right? So it lights up and SQL goes, wow, RAM, and just tries to grab as much RAM as it can. Right, and when, it hap when that happens, everything above one gig of physical RAM has to come from swap or ballooning. 
right? So you're automatically creating a really, really bad situation anytime that you're doing memory limits. Now, what you should take away from this, okay? There are, again, there are situations where memory limits make sense. But what you should take away from this, this is really important, is that it's, as a best practice, it's always best to limit your memory, so, so to do the memory limiting, as close to the application as possible. Think about that. Okay, you got various layers in the stack. So you got the hypervisor layer, and you got the VM layer where you can assign reservations and limits and whatnot. And you got Windows, or whatever your OS of choice is. And then you got SQL, or whatever the application is. So there's four places where I can actually manage that memory. It's best to do that as close to the application as possible. And if I can't do the application, then come back a step. And if I can't do it in the operating system, come back a step. Because elements at the top of that stack cannot see what's being limited down below it. Okay, this is just really useful in terms of a best practice for how you do things. This takes me to number 12, which reminds me of a great little story about a poor friend of mine that I've told this story eight, eight million times, and I, I hope he's not in the audience today. So we were, I, I was at some client, whatever, with, with a coworker of mine, and this coworker of mine, we're having an argument, he and I were having an argument. He was one of the, you know the, you know the type, the IT pro type, right? I don't trust anything that autom is automated. You know, that, you know that type, right? And he's like, no, I'm smarter than DRS. I said, all right, I'll, I'll bet you lunch that if we set this for manual to fully automated, we'll go to lunch and we come back, and VMs are in a different place, well, you're buying lunch. You can guess what happened, right? We went to lunch, we came back, and all the VMs were in a different place. DRS is, again, a mathematical model coupled with a, a set of monitoring calculations. And so there's nothing to it, right? It's going to collect all these calculations. It's going to monitor and see what the VMs need. And then it's just going to do what it needs to based off of math. And the last I checked, math has generally been proven, right? At least the basic functions like add, subtract, multiply, and divide, all right? What the problem is, I think, necessarily with fully automated is not so much the fact that it's something we shouldn't trust. It's number 13, that we don't understand its rebalancing equations. Okay? Everybody here okay with math? Because this is about to get crazy. DRS is in many ways, okay, close your eyes for, with me for a minute and imagine a table, right? Maybe it's a bar table. Right? And it's got one leg at the center. And each of the sides of that table represents one of the hosts in your cluster. And the weight of that host corresponds to how much activity is going on on that host. All right? So I've got this table, and it's kind of wobbly, right? Because, I don't know, I get a log on storm, and the domain controller starts to act up. And then I've got somebody send out a dirty email, and there's an exchange server that starts to act up. Right? So it's always moving around, and it's DRS's job to move those virtual machines around on those hosts so the table kind of sits up straight. Does this make sense? Okay, if we assume that that's what DRS's job is, there are some, as I said, mathematical equations that are used to determine how that table gets balanced. Every five minutes, DRS runs an interval. In its first step, it analyzes the resource utilization counters on every host, memory, CPU. It plugs those counters into that equation, the summation of the VM entitlements divided by the host capacity. Okay, pretty simple equation. The VM entitlements are set to the resource demand of CPU, right? So how many megahertz of, of processing oomph are you using? And what the memory working set is, so how much memory is actively being used? Uh, also, any memory reservations or limits impact this because you have to have, even if it's not using the reservation, well, it has to you know, have that reservation plugged into that. On the capacity side, we just add up the CPU and memory resources, integer numbers here, and subtract out the VM kernel overhead, service console overhead, some reservations for HA admission control, and then a 6% extra reservation, and the quotes were around extra when I looked this up. Um, to give us what the host capacity is. All right, so that creates essentially a quantity. Of that quantity, 
then a statistical mean and standard deviation are calculated out of that quantity. Does anybody here know what a mean is? Oh my God, no, oh God. Okay, okay, it's an average. <laughs> you guys didn't read the prerequisites for this class. Uh, Standard, devi standard deviation is a little more difficult, right? So standard deviation is, if this is my mean, right, my standard deviation is, how far away from that mean do I go? What is, my st that is the standard deviation from that mean? So what I then identify is what the mean amount for that table, remember the table thing, what the mean amount of load is. And the standard deviation represents how much am I occasionally off-balancing that DRS is trying to protect me against, right? So these calculations are important because they feed directly into the current host load standard deviation number that you see at the bottom of the DRS screen. This is the number that you, I don't know, I've been looking at that thing forever and trying to figure out what the heck it means, right? This is the second worst name thing in all of IT. So the current host load standard deviation for this particular cluster is set to 0.074. I've calculated the mean, and generally my vibrations from the mean are shifting at a very small amount, and so I'm considered to be load balanced at this point. Okay, this is cool. I'm in a good state. Now, I am in a good state because the target host load standard deviation Right? It, for those of you in the back, it's, it's uh, set to uh, less than or equal to 0 0.2. 0 0.04 is less than or equal to 0 0.2, and so I'm load balanced. The amount of wobbliness of my table is okay enough. Right? Shove some matches underneath one of the legs. So what this does is this gives me an idea of the mathematics behind how DRS determines whether the table is balanced or not, or, or if it's too unbalanced and, and we're not really getting somewhere. Now, if we get to be too unbalanced, right, the, the standard deviation starts getting way out of whack, well, then I've got to do something in order to fix it. Right? The DRS does. Right? It moves VMs around. So what does it do to fix it? It then runs through a series of migration simulations, pretend V motions. And after each pretend V motion, it figures out, well, how unbalanced would the table be if I did that V motion? And it plugs that in to figure out which one has the greatest impact on the balancing. Okay? For each simulated move, it calculates the resulting current host load standard deviation and plugs that value into that ridiculous equation. Okay, that is the standard deviation divided by 0.1 times the square root of the number of hosts in the cluster. Then we apply the ceiling operator. Five points for anybody who can tell me what the ceiling operator is. Round up to the nearest integer. All right, so I'm gonna end up with you know, 3.687 repeating, and I just round up to four. Subtract that from six, and I get two. Now, what does this two equal? That two equals the migration threshold that you've applied. So when you set that slider for apply priority one, priority two, priority three, what have you, what you're doing is you're identifying, well, how out of whack does my table have to get before I take action? Does this make sense? Is this mind-blowing, anybody? Nobody. You're all like, I knew this years ago. Well, fine, leave. Um, your migration threshold determines which migrations are going to be automatically done. Now, this is the really important part as in terms of your configuration, which I think is funny, especially considering coming from a long-haired ponytail guy. <laughs> that I'm dumb. You can be too liberal with that migration threshold. Right? I don't know. Maybe you're one of those control freak oriented IT pro people, right? And you want a table that is rock solid. And so you pulled your migration threshold to the, um, I don't know, what's lefter than liberal? Um, the, the liberal side. 
But what it's doing is the more of migrations, the migrations with lower priorities have less of an impact on getting that table to the perfect amount of balance. Every migration, however, takes time and effort and, and, and attention from the hypervisor. So there's a trade-off between the perfect balance and the just good enough balance to keep things loaded appropriately. The moral of the story here is, well, recognize that there's that slider is there and attune it for how important it is for you to maintain that best amount of balance across all the virtual machines and all the hosts that you have. Remember always that these priority one recommendations are mandatory. These are your special cases, right? Um, and maintenance mode, standby mode. Uh, if you violate an affinity rule, remember after an HA event, it goes, ah, and then moves everything over? Well, if it violates an affinity rule, it has to move things around again. Or if doing so after an HA event, the summation of the VM reservations exceed that host's capacity. It needs to rebalance again in order to fix things. So this takes me to big mistake number 15. It is entirely possible for you to have too many cluster hosts. A cluster in vSphere 4.1 can handle up to 32 hosts and 3,000 VMs. Anybody there? Just curiosity. Anybody got a 32 host cluster? I got one. You, you are the guy with all the money. I'm going to give you my card after this. Um, remember, each additional host adds more simulation load. And I'm going to, uh, I want to give props to the Epping Deniman book. Um, you had a copy of it up here somewhere I was talking to. Uh, HA and DRS, what was, the, what was the name of the new one exactly? Uh, it's now called Clustering, VMware vSphere 5 Clustering. That's the, that's the new book. Go buy that book. I don't even know these guys, but go buy their book, because it's really good. Um, the experts, as in these guys, suggest that DRS's sweet spot is somewhere between 16 and 24 hosts. There's another copy right there. So what this sweet spot asserts is that you're not wasting too much by having too small of a cluster. Remember, if I only have four hosts, 25% of my cluster I'm just using as waste. If I have 24 hosts, that's a much smaller number I can't add on stage. Um, if I have too many, then there's extra simulation effort. More importantly also, I start bumping up against that 32 host maximum, which means that it just makes it harder for me to segregate the cluster when I hit that maximum. So having sometimes multiple clusters can be a better idea. And VMware will sell you another product that will layer over the top of your multiple clusters to help you manage them as one single unit. All right? I'm sure there are um, sessions about that while we're here this week. So keeping the right number of hosts, a balanced number of hosts in your cluster is similarly important. Also, uh, a, a big challenge that I see across a lot of, of environments is creating big VMs. And I say this when you're creating them unnecessarily so. You guys remember the hypervisor wars, right? Remember the hypervisor wars? It VMware, Hyper-V, VMware, Hyper-V, right? And back then, VMware's, one of their big sales points was this notion of memory over commit, right? We can do memory over commitment, Hyper-V can't. And so consequently, many of us used it. Who here has got domain controllers that are still running at four gigs of RAM? Right? Nobody wants to raise their hand. I love doing that. When one guy shoots his hand up and realizes, oh wait, I just realized what I've said about myself. Overcommitment actually creates extra work for the hypervisor. If I have that four gig DC, and it's really only using half a gig, right? When I'm doing these calculations, DRS has to do the calculations based off of the assigned amount of resources. Even though it's only using so much, it has to base them off of what it has the potential to use. So you're actually unnecessarily impacting the equations for how you properly balance your machines. Assigning the right amount of memory and as few processors as possible to your VMs helps protect that. It also lowers, apparently, now your cost. Yeah. <laughs> they actually applauded in the last section when I said that. <laughs> Anybody here from VMware? <laughs> yeah, raise your hand. Because <laughs> we'd love to have a conversation with you. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. This is a personal opinion statement, but any company that tries to differentiate themselves based off of a feature that they then later on charge you for needs to have a stern talking to. So those are my 16 different um, settings. Uh, hopefully you've learned something out of this. I'll give you a little Easter egg here. Uh, DRS actually has a change to the invocation frequency. You can actually customize how often DRS will automatically take its own advice, right? Um, <laughs> no one take a picture of that, please. I showed her that slide. She goes, oh, Greg. Actually, actually it's funny, in the last, in the last um, one, she said, will you take a picture of your audience because I never know what you actually do for a living. So will you do me a favor and just pretend like you really like what you're, why you're here? Yay! Hi, hi Greg's wife. <laughs> OK, cool. I will post that on my Twitter account or something. So, so Twitter me, or friend me on Twitter. Whatever it's called. <laughs> I love this life. Oh, on your vCenter server, locate that file, add in the following lines, and then uh, obviously 300 seconds here is the number of seconds that you can adjust. Set it for longer, uh, set it for shorter if you want it to rebalance uh, in different ways. So. Uh, things to remember after the beers, right? You got this session, you got the general session, you got free beer night, right? So remember me. So things to remember after the beers, right? For the love of whomever it is you love, right? Turn on HA and DRS, right? E e well, make sure you have enough hardware first, right? Buy enough hardware and then turn it on so you have enough to support that failover. You probably already paid for it if you bought the right license level. You probably already paid for it. It's smarter than you. It's a great technology for protecting yourself against the really, really bad things. Also, understand why your VMs move around. You now know more about that because you've been in this class or in this session, and hopefully I've been able to educate you on that. And also, make gosh darn sure you save some of those cluster resources in reserve. Waste is good, and at the end of the day, you'll thank me for it. Thank you very much.